This is MJ. I'm an author. I'm an artist. I'm an analyzer. Welcome to this final special episode of Red Panda Report, where I'm talking a bunch about the shadow before I talk about the Red Panda, because the marvelous mass mystery man is inspired by, chiefly, I believe, the shadow himself, who is Lamont Cranston, young uh, man about town, or wealthy young man about town, who, with the assistance of his uh, partner and friend, Margot Lane, stopped a bunch of crimes as the shadow. She was the only one who knew his identity, and you will find out as we start going through the Red Panda soon that there's only one person who knows the identity of the Red Panda. And uh, But that's for another day. Today we're going to talk about a very uh, different iteration of uh, the shadow, a very modern iteration of the shadow, being the 1994, I know that's almost 30 years ago now, but the 1994... Uh, movie adaptation of The Shadow, which does an interesting blend of the novels and the radio shows to build its own unique shadow mythos. Uh, I read a very interesting review of this from a major shadow fan, which I think I should put in the show notes, uh, that uh, this was supposed to be the start of you know, the, uh, the shadow cinematic universe and uh, which it's not actually the very first shadow movie and there was shadow on TV, but I don't know if those were made for TV movies or, you know, TV specials. What do they call those? Miniseries or anything like that. Uh, so anyway, this is, I'm not saying it's the unique film, but it's the only film I'm watching and talking about. So, uh, here we are folks. Let's go ahead and, uh, let's go ahead and do this. So, uh, I didn't actually take the time to make notes. The only thing I want to take special note of is, uh, I remember the shadow. <laughs> I don't know if I've talked about this yet. I remember the shadow because down in my area of Southern California, there was an AD plumbing company. And there was a little old man, bald, with probably bespectacled as well, who I imagine is old enough that he heard the shadow episodes brought to you by Blue Coal. Call your Blue Coal dealer. And he liked it as a kid. And then when he became a businessman, he said, hey, I'm going to do TV and radio commercials for my plumbing business that's named after me. So it would go something along the lines of who knows what darkness lurks in the heart of your plumbing. Eighty he do. And not only did I hear that ridiculously uh, played on the radio, but my grandfather, who was a uh, a small business owner and a uh, AM radio advocate or, or uh, avid listener, at least to some select programs that we don't need to discuss right now, uh, he heard that commercial and he would do it and he would make fun of it and you know mock it or repeat it or whatever. And it's it's less making fun and mocking. It's just. It's funny. A D do. And I don't remember if he told me, because I said, Grandpa, what's this? Uh, and he said, Oh, it's the shadow, it was this old thing. It said, who knows who you know what evil looks in the hearts of men, the shadow does, but instead it's A D do because this guy's advertising for his business. But anyway, uh, it's just it's funny because the commer- the the commercial aspect of the shadow is something that I find delightful and it really tickles me. The blue coal ads are funny. Uh, in like while I'm waiting impatiently for myself to do this review. I've been listening to the, uh, the original, uh, goofy universe of the red panda adventures or the red panda, which there's six episodes of those, which again, you can find at Dakota ring theater.com. Um, uh, and, uh, those are just funny and they have stuff like, uh, you know, nutrient flakes that are being advertised in the show and they have ad reads that are going and like the narrator gets whacked by somebody because he's reading the narration for the he's reading the ad the ad copy during the show and you know they want the the you know the characters in the show it's it's making fun of itself and the genre or not the genre but like the medium um you know they like you hear them like whacking him and he's like he gets hit multiple times he goes from one ad to the next and he's like all right back to the show <laughs> and then it continues um but the the commercial aspects of the shadow are interesting because like at the end of the seasons they would say uh you know if you want to see the show continue, call up your, you know, make sure you plot, you buy plenty of blue coal or call up your local blue K, blue coal dealer and tell them that you loved hearing these shadow programs, uh, which of course contain more advertising for the blue coal company and, uh, America's number one anthracite. I've only listened to like, I've, I've listened to maybe I'll just call it like 15 vintage shadow episodes, but that's stuck in my head now. 
Yeah, our uh, our anthracite is colored blue at the factory uh, in a very safe way so that you can identify our coal by sight. It's the cleanest and the best well burning. And this coal was engineered specifically, or no, the heaters and stoves were engineered specifically to burn well with this coal. It's just, it's unbelievable how blatant and, and open and unabashed they were with the marketing of these things. But honestly, uh, you know, it's funny because a uh, hundred years later, almost a hundred years later, that's what marketing is now. Uh, you know, I'm an aspiring author, and uh, part of the reason I'm so tempted to go indie is because uh, the publishing, if you are published by one of the big, was it four now? Maybe it's big four. Anyway, if you want to be trad pub, you still have to do uh, shows and maybe travel, do book signings, do all sorts of things that I don't want to have to do. Um, and the the way and they, they should i'm sure they're going to be moving to print on demand and not just printing you know uh scads of books that aren't potentially going to sell because it's just a more efficient business model but like there's a lot of things that don't make sense but anyway regardless my point is you have to do the same type of marketing and hustle for your books to sell if you're an indie publisher or if you're a you know, self-published or if you're if you're traditionally published so why not go indie and then have all the freedom and creative control that you want sure you're putting yourself out on the line but that's what you do when you believe in yourself and when you believe in what you're doing or a product you're selling, you're willing to, to take those risks in order to make it happen. And maybe you find a little audience and it works for you, or maybe you find a huge audience. It doesn't matter, but uh, the shadow would put himself out there and that's what I'm planning to do too. But anyway, uh, sorry, I just had to do that. Oh, and also my grandfather would also tell me, and he wouldn't just say this to me, but I heard it a lot enough. So it sticks, it sticks in my mind too. Not a good idea, Pop. And uh, the shadow in this movie, Alec Baldwin delivers this line, that's not a good idea. And then he does something, you know, beats somebody up or whatever. And I just, when I heard that, this, like the shadow, I will always link with my grandfather because of those AD do commercials. And uh, I believe he actually took us to go see this in the theater. And he wasn't like a massive, he, he was a very, he was a fun guy. And the things that he jammed to more were like music. He had records and stuff that he would play and he really liked certain people. But as far as movies, he'd go see like the big blockbusters and the spectacles. And I think this was supposed to be that in 94 and it, it, it wasn't, it, you know, it kind of flopped. Um, but uh, another one of his favorite things to say was ridiculous. And I'm sure more than once he yelled or proclaimed ridiculous while we were watching this movie. And uh, yeah, that was his opinion. And mine is that it's pretty darn cool. <laughs> <laughs> so it's different tastes and different, uh, you know, di for different tastes for different people. But I think we both agree that the old radio shows are cool and that the books are even cooler. So anyway, uh, with that preface and a little homage to my grandfather who's been passed for some time now, uh, I just, you know, I'm ready to jump into the actual, uh, the actual discussion of this. And uh, I want to discuss the things I didn't like, the things I did like and some other things, just kind of extraneous. And, you know, this is tangentially related to the Red Panda, so I'm kind of feeling even more comfortable being a little more casual with it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So, anyway, uh, yeah, I'll just go, I'll go right into it. I don't have that much, and there's actually not uh, a ton to talk about. It's an interesting movie. They did some interesting thing with this, things with the special effects to make the shadow invisible. Oh, let me roll back though real quick. <laughs> I do feel like probably one of the biggest problems with the movie is that it works better if you know the material better. And uh, that is to say, I had not read or listened to rather the audiobooks, a few audiobooks worth of The Shadow until after I had f watched this movie for the second time a few months ago. So again, I saw it almost 30 years ago and then I saw it like four or five months ago. And then I just, cause I was playing around with doing this, this whole red Panda report thing at the time. And then I just finally decided to go ahead and do it. So now we're doing it. And, uh, I, in the meantime, I listened to a couple shadow novels cause I, I do want to pull in that pulp, uh, pulpy goodness and put it in my stuff, my, my own writing. And I thought, well, I should listen to this good, you know, solid source material. Taylor liked it. You know, lots of other people have liked shadow. This is like classic. There are 300 books for a reason, you know? Uh, and anyway, so I decided to check those out. And then when I came back to this movie after that, I thought, oh, there's that, there's that, there's that. There's all these cool things that if you know the lore of the shadow, if you've been a shadow fan, it pops and it feels like, oh, this is, it's kind of like coming home. You know, it, it has an, a feeling of nostalgia and, uh, I didn't get that, you know, watching it a few months ago, but, um, so that's a problem. It doesn't really, 
maybe it's not a problem. Maybe it's actually a strength of it that it feels like it can stand on its own. It can include these elements without telling you that's from the book uh, or that's from the radio show. Because uh, Margot Lane herself is from the radio show. Uh, as far as I know, she never appears in the books. Um, although there is a reference in the like fifth or sixth book to the weekly radio broadcast that the Shadow has been doing for years now. And no one knows if that's the actual Shadow or if it's somebody else or what it is. And I like the idea that uh, Gibson included that in his books and that that's like some sort of like almost like a psyop that the, uh, the Shadow does on the uh, criminal underworld that he's fighting and anybody else really uh, but it very well could just be the the radio show hosted by Blue Cole which is fun and you could even have a world where the shadow was real and somebody decided to make a you know radio show about it working off of the fame of this urban legend like that's actually that's actually a really cool idea but anyway uh, of course if that was made today that would end up with uh, somebody going in I guess it'd be like the Grey Ghost episode of Batman the Animated Series where you'd have somebody going and rescuing the you know the fake shadow from you know a real threat but anyway uh, which actually, uh, they kind of did something like that in Red Panda. Was it Red Incense? Or they called the guy? Anyway, uh, I, I, uh, I'm I getting way off track. Um, but yeah, so I felt like it was a little weak in some ways in that it almost seemed like it depended on, upon you knowing and liking the serials. Well, the serials or the books, which you shouldn't have to do. Um, I also thought it was odd. Like, I was very shocked by the Ying Ko introduction. The cold open with Ying Ko, this drug kingpin, who turns out to be played by... Alec Baldwin, and he's got these long, nasty purple nails, and uh, it's just, it's kind of weird, because it goes from that to him being forced into a redemption by the, uh, I don't know, the, the, the Toku, the, the Tuko, I can't remember, the, the holy man, who has a big shrine, and who has the master, who has mastered the powers of the mind, and who you know, teaches this stuff to the shadow, to Laurent Cranston, and then to, um, I guess to, oh man, what's his name? To Khan. I'll just say Khan, because that's all I know. John Lowe. <laughs> that's who, the actor. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but he's made him uh, into a shadow-type person as well. And I don't know if it's because he was trying to reform him as a barbarian and make him a second agent of himself, which is... That's actually interesting that the, the Toku, or the Tuko, whatever... Tuku? The Tuku. Uh, that sounds right. Uh, the, the Tuku, uh, I- interestingly enough, in the movies, plays a similar role to the shadow where he implements agents around the world doing what he taught them to do for the betterment of mankind. But obviously it went wrong when uh, Khan turned against him and murdered him and and went on this quest for world domination. Um, Yeah, and like his characterization is a little weak and his motivation, other than he's kind of a, you know, madman who wants to take over the world, is a little weak because they don't talk about his, I can't remember, and it's not Shangri-La, but like there's like a secret underground, like uh, special society of... Mongols, basically, of you know people for of, you know people like Genghis Khan uh, and his fellow Mongols, and that idea is there, like the germ of it is there. But I know that because of the Golden Master, which actually contains that idea. So there was a little bit of a weakness in the script that it just it made things unclear, and they made certain choices and decisions for the story to make it you know such without actually doing all the work themselves in the script writing like it could have been a much more simple story it didn't need to be this con story it didn't need to be and i i I think there's a little bit of a a weakness to the narrative that you're introducing the shadow and already from movie one he's facing a character who has powers similar to his own but greater than his own and i would think that that makes it more difficult for us to understand what his powers actually are because we don't get them fully explained but that um maybe they wanted to use contrast between Khan and Cranston to show what each of them can can do to show the the extent of their powers. It's funny because it's kind of like Batman Begins is like a a like much better version of this movie because you have the guy in, you know, vague Asian country being trade trained by a mysterious master and then another pupil of or, you know, whatever equivalent of the master comes at him in his hometown with his own technology with something massive that will destroy the city and that's uh, i don't know i guess it's just a simple story i'm not accusing nolan or anybody who worked on batman begins of stealing the idea but um like you know a superior version of this is uh batman begins ironically uh in the history of the shadow which i've mentioned or alluded to before uh Batman, the first issue of Batman, I believe it was, actually stole a uh, stole a bunch of stuff 
ideas and, and setting and all sorts of stuff from a shadow story. Um, some about Ace Chemicals, I think is what it was. Anyway, um, so that's interesting. But yeah, like I said, there's a little bit of a weakness to the story, but that kind of doesn't matter because it's really exciting and really fun to see the shadow brought to life on the big screen for me this way. And there's a lot of cool things that they do with the shadow, like, you know, using his agents, which I think is a, a wonderful idea. They show him saving somebody in the beginning of the movie, and that man is drafted in to the shadow's army. And he gets this, you know, special glowing ring, and he gets these, uh, you know, code words to say. And then Cranston himself appears to the man later as a fellow agent of the shadow. Now, he lets the man assume that. He says, one of my, you know, because he tells him, one of my agents will contact you. And then he himself, as Cranston goes and contacts the man, and he's like, oh, you're an agent of the shadow, aren't you? And he's like, who? And he's like, oh, that's right. Because, you know, it's all subterfuge and spy type stuff. And that's really fun. And it's it's interesting because you get to see this guy in like an, his normal life, um, like having dinner with his wife or just having a conversation they're listening to the radio at breakfast and he gets the call from cranston and he goes with him and they do you know whatever shadow ops type stuff hey that's funny um <laughs> and then later you see mo uh, moshe shrevi um doing something similar and his wife says what is that is that another thing from the bowling league the bowling club and he's like yeah it is so it's kind of funny it's kind of quaint it's kind of cute this idea that you had these men like ordinary you know overweight chubby no six pack whatever just like ordinary guys you know the the asian guys are like a metal urgist or something like that and he helps examine a, a coin for cranston to figure out you know what is going on and you know who this threat is and then uh shrevi's just a just a you know just your average joe a schlub if you will um and he is doing great things in this other life that you know he hides from his wife or whatever and it's just i don't know it's a really interesting idea really interesting dynamic it's very exciting to think that these ordinary men can be living such extraordinary lives and doing such amazing things that lead to them saving people's lives i mean trivi was instrumental in saving i can't remember the scientist guy's name um, but he was instrumental in saving him because he was there you know driving around cranston you know helping the shadow do his thing and that's a really neat idea and uh there's something very noble to that and I don't know, kind of beautiful about the, uh, this like secret society of, you know, ordinary men doing good things because they can and because they have another man uh, leading them to do these great things, which is interesting when you contrast what Yin Ko was, what Lamont Cranston was as this drug, uh, you know, kingpin crime lord guy. He was, uh, happy to murder people. He, um, <laughs> he was happy to murder people and... In fact, we get to see flashbacks of him later in the movie through uh, the use of, you know, Margot Lane as an expo expository device, sort of, um, in her psychic connection to him, where we see her uh, reaching into his memories as he's, he's, or I guess into his nightmares as he's having memories of his past life as, as a barbarian where he's attacking and killing people in a village to, I would assume, uh, solidify his power and... Uh, it was all for selfish gain, and he was a leader of men, uh, a commander of armies in the past, but to, to great evil, and for his own selfish gain, and now he's doing it thanks to this redemption that was forced upon him for the good of people, and yet he's filling a similar role, it's just he's directing it in a positive, life-giving, generative way as opposed to a selfish, destructive way. Anyway, I, I got a little carried off uh, talking about the beauty and wonderment of superhero fiction and redemption, which are things I'm obsessed by or obsessed with. Um, but they did some really cool stuff with him becoming invisible, like uh, his footsteps showing in, up in water. And, um, you know, that's how a bad guy was able to see him. And that was really cool because, uh, you know, he would have certain tells. <sighs> he would have certain tells like that to his... Uh, you know, physically being there despite the fact that he's invisible. And that's, you know, that's clever. It's a clever idea to explore and something to show. Uh, 
and the uh, animated shadows that they did like on walls or going yeah going up walls or going upstairs different things like that were really delightful to see i love uh you know traditional 2d you know hand painted animation on uh you know film cells and that's how they did it at the time i absolutely love that and there's no reason you couldn't do that with digital um with digital work now you could still i think do you know digital painting of something on a uh, and then, you know, put that onto something that was filmed digitally as well. So I, I definitely think that's possible, and it's uh, something I'd like to see. Like, for example, I love the lightning effects of, like, Palpatine's electricity from, uh, well, Return of the Jedi, and then uh, when they did it in the uh, prequel trilogy, it was less wonderful than it was back then. Also, the lightning effects in Ghostbusters and things like that. Um, so I, I love that practical 2D effect. Um, it looks a little cartoonish, but it's very expressive. The, the shadow silhouette flat on the wall was very expressive and did some very interesting things. And like when he was uh, tormenting, uh, I want to call him Tim Robbins, but I know that's not his name. The guy from Rocky Horror Picture Show? That guy. Uh, when he was tormenting him before that guy died, uh, that was uh, pretty cool to see uh, the way he was affecting the shadow moving around the room. And, oh, there was another thing. So I was trying to think of all the... I love his transformation into the figure of the shadow um, because he, he loses his Alec Baldwin looks. I, I find it odd that they didn't give him green eyes like that sign has. Instead, they gave him these like black eyes, which is cool. But the prosthetics that they put him in to change the shape of his face and give him that, you know, that big nose, that, you know aquiline nose i think is what they call the you know like an eagle beak nose um and some of the other flourishes that they did to make the shadow like the big bushy eyebrows and stuff like to make him look like the guy on the book uh, on the book covers was really cool and i absolutely love it i think it's a brilliant move and uh, i really like it and i think i like baldwin i mean he's not like the most attractive man ever but he's a good looking guy and like the shadow you know that face is less classically handsome so having him transform and kind of become ugly uh, as the shadow, as he's this you know weird predatory creature of the night stalking evil, uh, is interesting because there's this line in the movie about his own dark heart, his own black heart. Like, he knows what darkness lurks in the hearts of men because that darkness lurks, or, you know, his heart has been, had been consumed or subsumed in that darkness as well. And uh, almost, like, to me, an idea of, like, the portrait of Dorian Gray where the picture becomes ugly, that as he becomes the shadow, like, all that darkness comes to the surface, and it makes him hideous. And uh, while he's hideous, he is at his most monstrously powerful. Hold on. And uh, that's when he's able to unleash all these powers. And I, I just think that's really cool. Oh, one more aesthetic thing I loved is when he would do a hypnotism or a mind control on somebody where they would either... They would cause shadows... Uh, to go everywhere but his eyes, or they would just brighten his eyes. I think it was almost all, always shadows over his eyes, or shadows on either side of his eyes, you know, above and below. And that was a really great effect. Um, the only place I ever remember seeing that before was like in Adam's family when the woman would try to be alluring to her husband, or like, you know, mysterious shots. It's been long, it's been decades since I've seen the Adam's family movies, the live action ones I'm talking about from the 90s. Um, Gomez and. Not Elvira, that's the other lady, Mistress of the Night or whatever. Um, but uh, anyway, that's an old technique from black and white films, I believe, and it was used to great effect here, and you can do it in full color, which was kind of interesting to see. So there's a lot of cool, interesting visual flourishes. Watching the pneumatic tube uh, traveling, um, like you're traveling through the, through the pneumatic tube pipe, uh, as that message is being uh, delivered from the Jonas building or from the B. Jonas office, uh, was super cool, very delightful. Um, there was just a lot of interesting visual flourishes and a lot of interesting things going on, but it just wasn't uh, wasn't quite all it could have been. There was one more thing I want to bring up from my notes, which is, uh, oh, yeah, gadgets. So Khan wasn't the best villain, and I already talked about that a little bit, but um, just real quick, the pneumatic mail tubes were really cool to see. Uh, the fact that he has early computers in his shadow sanctum, um, the glowing rings, I don't know if that's supposed to be technological or mystical or magical somehow, but that was, you know, neat. And then he's got a, when Khan invades his sanctum, he uh, backs himself up to a wall, Lamont does, and he hits a, like a molding so that a gun will pop out, a loaded gun, so he can try to shoot him, but he's already gone by that point. Um, let me see. I talked about his mythos. Um, Lamont Cranston. So this is about lore stuff. Lamont Cranston is the shadow, but he wasn't always. He was a drug lord. I talked about that already. It's fu funny that his uncle's the police commissioner. That's odd. Um, Cranston was forcibly redeemed and turned into a fighter of evil. I already talked about that. And he seems to have 
telepathic coercion or hypnosis power that I'm unaware of from the books or the show, which is kind of interesting. But anyway, that's just rounding me out and making sure I say everything I wanted to say, but I'm going to have to cut this short for now. I went longer, much longer than I thought I was going to, and here we go. I bid you adieu. Next time, I will be talking about The Riddle of the Sphinx, which is the very first episode of The Red Panda. I hope you enjoyed that. Go to mjmunoz.com to leave any questions, comments, or other feedback you might have. There you can find all of my analysis, art, and fiction. I cover books, tokusatsu, comic books, anime, and more. Look around. You're sure to find something else that you'll enjoy as well. This has been a Story Over Everything production.